Uh, so Sean, thanks so much for joining us tonight, uh, taking time out of your busy schedule to kind of lend your advice and wisdom to, to the young people here. We do record it, obviously. Uh, and so we have a lot of members who um, watch the recordings because they are busy Sunday nights for whatever reason. Um, and so, yeah, we're very grateful that you could join us. Um, what we'd like to do tonight, what, what we normally do with uh, expert guests is we spend a few minutes, 10, maybe 15 minutes, somewhere in there. Sean, we'll just have you kind of tell your story uh, and you know what you're focused on today, what, what you're involved with today. And then after that, we'll open it up for Q&A with the members and you. I'll kind of facilitate that. Um, and we'll, we'll just have fun for the next hour. Does that sound good? Sounds good. Thanks for having me. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Well, Dan, thanks again for having me on. I think this is an amazing community that you've created. And honestly, I'm proud of all of you guys who are, you know, taking this time out of your busy weekends to learn about like financial freedom at a super young age too. Like I didn't get into this till after I graduated from college, I was starting to work. Um, so you guys are already like way ahead of the game just by being here. So props to all of you guys for being here. Um, so do you want me to just start and go through I guess, my story and all that stuff? Yeah. Um, and don't be humble, by the way. I, you know, I always tell the guests, we want to hear all of your, all of your successes. For example, I've already told them this, but you have over a million followers on TikTok, which is amazing. Um, you know, that's not your only accomplishment. I just threw that one out there. So, um, and then also if you could begin, Sean, just tell us where you're at, how old you are, and then you know, anything from your story, going back as far as you want, college, high school, even, even before that you feel would be, you know, important to, you know, emphasize your story and how you got to where you are today. Okay. Sounds good. So yeah, for some context, my name is Sean Pan, um, originally a Bay area resident in California, but recently moved to Dallas, Texas with my wife. Um, we currently own 33 units in our portfolio. Um, the gross rent comes out to be around 29,000 a month after you know, all that stuff. And um, yeah, like you mentioned, I have around 1.1 million on TikTok and around 180,000 on Instagram. Most of my content is based on real estate and this real estate hacks. Um, I also work as a hard money lender. So for all of you guys who are interested in fixing and flipping, we do loans specifically for investors. Uh, now, how I got to be where I am today, I actually was just like a lot of you guys, you know, went to school, thought that I would just go to college get a job and then work there until I retire. And that was the plan. You know, I, I got decent grades. I went to UCLA for undergrad. I studied electrical engineering and got my master's degree in electrical engineering as well. Then I worked for companies like Boeing and uh, Northrop Grumman on these billion dollar satellite programs. And those, those are cool, right? Working on big spacecraft. It's very nice and all, but the problem came when I was talking to my older coworkers, people who are like 30 years older than me, basically my dad's age and how unsatisfied they were financially about how like disgruntled they were that the company wasn't treating them the way that they thought they would be treated, right? These guys were really good employees. They did a lot of business for the company and they would get like, you know, $5,000 bonus uh, at the end of the year, even though they made the company millions of dollars. Or um, in the worst case, I had a, a friend who was maybe three years uh, until he qualified for a retirement package. And if you guys don't know, like a, a retirement package, usually something with pension, meaning that the company would pay a certain amount of money uh, for the rest of their lives, basically. And three years before he qualified for that, they actually let him go because he was, uh, you know, paid too high. And that like disrupted his life's plans. Like he, he expected to get this pension and they just took it away from him. And he thought like, man, if I knew that they were going to do this to me, I would have like left companies a long time ago, but he valued that pension so hard. So it made me realize that I, I cannot rely on this one employer and you need to do side hustles. You need to be able to take care of yourself. Um, so that got me into reading a lot of books about investing and uh, different businesses. And I actually tried different businesses, right? I tried some startups with my friends. I tried to sell some products on Amazon, like selling selfie sticks on Amazon, but those didn't really work as well as like real estate. The beauty with real estate investing is it's a pretty... Uh, quote unquote, a simple business. With other businesses, there is a big component of luck. Whereas with real estate, it's not that hard to just buy a property that cash flows well and be successful. Um, so, you know, I got the bug, bought one property, then bought another one, kept saving and then kept rolling it over and over and over again. So, 
yeah, long story short, that's how we ended up buying our properties. Then I met my wife. We started buying properties together. And uh, yeah, so then now we create content. Um, again, I do hard money loans and I left my job as engineering. So we basically just do this full time now. Can you talk, a, uh, thanks, Sean, by the way. Can you talk a little bit more about your real estate portfolio? What types of units? Where are they? Um, maybe highlight one of the one of your favorite properties. Yeah, so a majority of our portfolio comprised of long-term rentals. So we're not really doing anything super fancy. Um, we basically buy standard cash flowing properties and they're located across the country. So we have them in some in California, some in Florida, some in Texas, and some in Georgia. Um, most of them are in the $100,000 price point uh, like per unit. And then they rent for around that $1,000 mark or so. Um, one of my favorite ones is probably this fourplex that I picked up maybe four years ago. Um, this property, again, it, nothing too special, right? You bought it, I bought it for $250,000 at the time. And it was renting for around six hundred and fifty dollars per unit. Um, the beauty is for multifamily properties. Uh, usually, you have to pay for the utilities as a as a landlord, right? But for this particular property, the utilities were already separated, so the tenants pay for that. So it's more return for me. Um, but then you flash forward till now, um, the rents have increased significantly. So now I'm getting like nine hundred fifty dollars per month per unit, and uh, it's just a nice stable fourplex. The value of that property has potentially doubled. And, you know, the beauty of real estate is you can buy properties with less money down, right? You don't have to pay 250 for the whole thing. You pay like a portion of that. So the actual returns are a lot higher than, you know, doubling. So. And where is that fourplex at? Uh, that one's in Jacksonville in Florida. Okay. Yeah. And could you also talk a little bit more about your hard money lending business? How did you get into that? Um, do you enjoy it? How much time do you spend working on that business? Yeah. So again, with hard money loans, it's a really fun job for me because uh, my job is basically to talk to other real estate investors full time. And um, I guess unlike, I guess it's hard for you guys to to know because you guys haven't probably haven't worked yet. But when you work with, um, I guess other other clients, they can be more difficult. But I think real estate investors know what they're getting themselves into, so it's really easy to work with them. And also for me, uh, I create content, right? So I just create a YouTube video and then people will find me to do loans with me versus my other coworkers have to like go out and call a lot of people and try to win their business, if that, that makes sense. So it's like a different way of getting sales. All right. And then I think the last question for me, although it may have some different parts to it. So you obviously are very committed to content creation. You have a podcast, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, probably some others that I, I don't even know about. Um, how important is that to you and your portfolio and your business? How much time do you spend on that? Do you enjoy it? Um, just tell us more about that piece of your overall life. Sure. So I'll tell you why I started content in the first place. Um, I was actually flipping homes back in 2017, 2018. And I, I got lucky on my first few. I did pretty well. But then I had this weird feeling where I wasn't, it's a, it's a weird feeling. It's like I wasn't satisfied, right? Because I did well, but I didn't feel like the rest of the people involved did really well. You know what I mean? Like I made profit, but my agent made his commission. Um, the person who sold me the house obviously sold it at a discount because he needed to sell quickly. Um, I don't know. I just didn't feel like I was really giving to society or whatever. So I created a podcast because I wanted to share information with other people. And what it turns out is that's the best decision I made because then I could interview great people like yourself or just, you know, amazing real estate investors out there and just learn a lot about what they do and being able to share that knowledge with the world. Um, so yeah, that's why I started my podcast and I've been doing that for about three years now, three and a half years. Uh, got into YouTube because I found out that podcasts don't actually spread that well, you know, algorithmically. Whereas with YouTube, they actually do spread it. And of course, TikTok and Instagram more so, right? Like, so with TikTok, um, I, well, I followed my wife's lead. So if you guys have heard of Sharon Sung, that's my wife. And she got pretty big on TikTok first. And then uh, after a year or so, she kind of like, she told me, okay, you should get on it. Kept begging me on. 
And then we made a plan to like uh, create content that actually we thought would go viral. And then that's what blew up my account to 1 million in a short time frame. Awesome. And then, so you just remind me of another question. Tell, tell us about, so you and Sharon, your wife, um, the way I envision it in my head is that you two are both into real estate and, and social media and doing well separately. And then you met, is that how it happened? Mm, not exactly. Um, so I mean, I was doing my podcast. I was doing real estate first. She came more from the online side. So she was doing digital nomading, meaning, uh, she just like left the United States for two years, traveled around the world and just like worked out of her laptop. And, um, she also did music videos back then too. Like she sings and stuff. So she already knew like YouTube before she met me. And then we met in 2019. She kind of showed me more of the online side. I showed her more of the real estate side. And then we started doing things together, but then also separately, right? Cause like I have my own channel. She has her own channel so that when there's like creative differences, she can do hers. I can do mine. So the question I have is how did you two meet? Um, another algorithm. We met through the online dating apps. Okay. All right. But you obviously had some very similar interests. So around... it's funny, like, yeah, on her bio, she wrote that she's into the fire movement. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. Like I'm there into the go. fire movement too. So it was really easy to talk. And uh, it's weird because she's basically like a female version of me. So it was like really easy to like, yeah. Yeah. And I know Sharon a little bit. Uh, and I think it's just so awesome that you two are, are so um, successful in your endeavors. And then you found each other. So all of you young people out there that are single, um, which is most of you, when you're out there looking to date, do what Sean did and find someone who has the same value system around money, around investing, around real estate or, or entrepreneurship, whatever it, it might be. Um, you know, that should be one of your top, not, not the top priority, but it should be one of those top 10 things you're looking for. Um, well, awesome. another point to that too, is we met relatively later you know what I mean? Like I was in my late twenties. She was also in her late twenties. Whereas like some people, they, they get married and whatever, like super early. And then they don't really have a chance to, you know, explore and find out what they really, really want. Yeah. 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 Uh, there's no right or wrong to that, but everyone's, everyone's paths a little different. So awesome. So I think we'll, we'll uh, switch gears again here and move over to the Q and a session. Um, our members usually have amazing questions for our guests. So members, uh, if you want to raise your digital hand uh, down in the reactions or you'll find it down there. Um, if you have a question for Sean, and then uh, I'll just call your name, unmute yourself, ask your question. Sean will will enlighten us with his wisdom. Um, and and I have, I have some more questions, but I'm going to get them started here out of the gate. So let's start off with Daniel. Hey, Sean, thanks for jumping on. Um, question about your real estate portfolio and it being uh, out of state. Um, how did you get your leads initially and how have you gone about continue to manage them? Um, and then how do you um, take on existing leads and analyze them and then buy them? Yeah, that's a great question. So actually I, before that, I'll get into like why I do out of state. Again, I was from the Bay Area. So like fixer uppers are $1 million dollars in the Bay area. And the numbers don't really make sense. Cause you can only rent out that house for like 3000 to 4,000, you know, be cash flow negative. So it was pretty much by necessity that we had to go out of state. I mean, you couldn't go to different parts of California, but similar, like it's not gonna mean where I live and I'm not gonna manage it myself. Um, so yeah, step one was finding out where we would invest because there's so many cities in the United States. And then, um, uh, second thing was building that team, which is like really important. And then third is actually finding the property. So uh, I don't know where you are with your investing or where you're trying to be, but hopefully you have those two lined up first before you find properties. Um, and we can go into them later if you want. But I mean, to your question of how I found leads, it was from my agent, especially when I was first getting started. I realized that there are so many components to real estate investing that if I tried to make everything super optimal right from the get-go, it would actually deter me from actually starting in the first place. I mean, there's a saying, right? That like perfect is the enemy of good. If you try to make everything perfect, you'll never get it done. So I said, you know what? My first deal, I don't need a super crazy home run. I just need a solid base hit. If the numbers make sense, okay, it's good. So I pretty much gave that criteria to my agent. Um, and then he would send me things here and there. Uh, 
I think, I think when you're first getting started, agents are going to do the lazy thing and just put you on a drip system where they'll, they'll put on some, some filters and then it'll automatically send you leads or like properties on MLS. You don't want those, right? They're just garbage, right? It's just sending you random stuff. Tell them like, no, I want specific deals. If you hear on your radar, then let me know. Um, so then we did, we found one, this property was on the market, but it was on the market for a while. Um, the sellers were other out-of-state investors and there were tenants in the property already. So because there's tenants in the property, I already knew that no regular home buyer would buy that property, right? Cause then they have to kick the tenants out. So only investors would want it. Um, and I was able to get it for a low price and et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, trust your team in the very beginning. They'll probably send you something from the MLS, which is not a bad deal, but, um, yeah, just make sure they're not just sending you random, like, like filters or whatever, an automated system. And, and then ongoing management. Yeah. So ongoing management, uh, property managers, um, we have different property managers for every different location that we own property in. Um, our main purpose of buying real estate is not to become managers ourselves. And I'm okay with uh, leaving some money on the table to pay someone else to do it. And I also know that these managers aren't going to manage it as well as me, but if, even if they're 80% as good as me, it's still worth the, like not having to do the headache. So we have property managers who handle everything. Awesome. Um, I have a couple of follow-up points to that. Uh, great question, Daniel. Um, when, when my wife and I decided to go out of state and start doing investing in Michigan, um, we did the same thing Sean did. We first found a really good agent in the area where we wanted to invest, which was a suburb of Detroit. And then he's the one that found us the deals and, and kind of started putting things in our inbox. Um, yeah, don't do all the work yourself. Find a good team and you're going to, well, our agent made money, not from us, but from the, the sellers of the properties. But that's why they make money is to do their job, let them do their job. Uh, yep. And oh, my follow-up question, Sean, do you and Sharon, do you, do you manage any of your properties at this point or, or none of them? So like I mentioned, I did live in the Bay Area before and then I moved um, to Texas. That property in the Bay Area, we converted it into uh, a midterm rental. Do you guys know what midterm rentals are? Have you guys discussed that before? Okay. So it's we, like a, a little bit. Yeah. I'll just say it again. So uh, like a long-term rental is traditional 12-month lease. Someone's in there. They put in their own furniture. They live there, whatever. Okay. And the short-term rental is like an Airbnb. Fully furnished. You know, They're in there, out there for like one or two days, and then they leave. Uh, in the city that I live in, they don't allow short-term rentals. So you get around that by doing something called a midterm rental. If you rent out your property for 31 days or longer, then the cities can no longer tell you what you can and can't do. It just becomes like a regular long-term rental and you can rent them as a fully furnished rental for a much higher price. So like we're renting our property in the Bay Area for around 5,500 a month. Whereas if it was a long-term rental, it would probably only go for 3,500 a month. Um, so we are managing that one ourselves because it's just that one property and it turns once a month. Okay. And then to our members. And uh, so I, I think midterm rentals or medium term rentals are kind of the next big thing. And uh, two of my friends, Ziana McIntyre and Sarah, um, I'm blanking on her name all the time. What's, we, Sarah Weaver. Uh, they just wrote a book published by Bigger Pockets about, midterm rentals that's come it's either coming out in the next month or two or it's already out so if any of the members are interested in um midterm rentals then that is the book to go to and i'm going to have both of them well ziana has been a, a guest of ours before sarah has not i'm going to have sarah on sometime because she is freaking awesome do you know sarah sean mm -hmm. yeah i've met multiple yeah. times yeah she's so she's so incredible um can't wait to have her on all right let's go to justin next question so um, when you mentioned that you had like 33 properties, I was um, curious um, as to how you go about like managing the bookkeeping of all that stuff. Oh, that's a great question. Bookkeeping is a nightmare. <laughs> if you don't have a good system. So recently we actually started using something called Stessa. Have you guys heard of Stessa before? No, I haven't. Okay, so go check it out. It's free. I think it's owned by Roofstock. Um, but basically it allows you to input all the information you want about your rental property. Um, 
you know, right addresses, how much debt you have on it, what are your monthly mortgage payments, and then all the expenses and then the income you get from it. Stessa does work with maybe like half of the major property management softwares. So if you use like, or if your property manager uses one of those property softwares, then it'll automatically sync. Um, but then the other half to manually input, which is kind of annoying. Like right now, um, my wife's father, so my father-in-law is retired and this keeps him busy. So he's okay with like going into our accounts and like putting in everything. But after you do it, um, it's really cool because it shows you the breakdown of like how much cash flow you had, um, how much money you're paying every month, what's your gross rents, what are your expenses. So you can kind of see everything tabulated. Um, but yeah, so it is, it is, it is rough, especially when you're dealing with multiple property managers and all the different softwares to use. Okay. So this says, is, is that just like an app you can like download on your phone or is it just like something on the computer? Mm, they probably have an app version, but you know, when it comes to like this kind of data entry, you probably want to just do it on a computer, but it's on the website. So yeah. how do you spell that? Uh, S T E S S A. Okay. Thank you. Great question. Um, all right, let's go next to Ben. Hey, Sean. Uh, I have two questions for you. Um, the first one is uh, you talked about specific, your, your strategy was to specifically create content that goes viral. Um, what was that process actually like for you? Like, how did you do that? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I guess we have some time. I'll give you the long story. Uh, so Sharon, again, she was already big on TikTok and she got invited to be part of like this trial group for um, TikTok. Like TikTok is owned by a Chinese company, right? And then they're called ByteDance. And then ByteDance reached out to her and said, hey, we're trying to promote something called Lives. So they had a, a bunch of creators like do Lives. And then uh, Sharon was kind of nervous. So she wanted me to be on the Lives with her. So then we do it together. And then like within a month, they actually shut the program down. And said, you know what? We're going to focus on another initiative, which is to bring new creators up. Uh, so then they're like, oh, why don't you get Sean to do it? So I was like, fine, I'll do it. Uh, and they put me on this strict regimen. They said, all right, if you want to be successful, here are things you have to do. Um, so if you want to be successful in TikTok, you can take notes here. The first thing they said was, uh, you know, you didn't have a good name, right? So you can't just have, I don't know, like the name should be something towards your niche you're trying to promote. Uh, the second thing is you need to create content that is super relevant to that niche. So don't just like post random things here and there. So if you want to post about financial content, don't post about financial content in one video and then about like a, a random cheeseburger on another video because then they'll be confused. Uh, what you can do is you can also just go on your own TikTok and like only look for, I don't know, like that niche that you're interested in so you can see what other people are posting in that niche that are big. And you can make your versions of those videos. So I still do that today. Like I have a virtual assistant and every morning we kind of wake up and I watch TikToks with him. I said, hey, do research, show me videos that did well in, in our niche. And then be like, oh, that's interesting concept. Maybe I can make a video based on that. So yeah, those were like the main things. Um, and then uh, because we were more focused on actually creating content that we thought people would watch, or we thought that was actually useful, that's why we think our account did pretty well. That makes sense. Thank you. Uh, my, my second question is uh, just, so I, I just started a YouTube channel I don't, three months ago. And, uh, you know, I'm doing that on top of other, you know, work and side hustles. So I'm just trying to like be as productive as possible. I've thought about repurposing content specifically, you know, onto TikTok and stuff like that, but I also don't want to build too many bridges and wear myself thin. Um, what would you suggest? Yeah. Um, I, I have the same problem, right? Like I was doing a podcast, YouTube, TikTok, uh, dude, I'm not gonna lie. Like YouTube is kind of hard, even for me, I've been doing it for three years. My YouTube is still under 9,000 subs. I don't know if that's good or not, but uh, I think like with YouTube, you have to create like really good in-depth videos for them to really mm -hmm. do well. Whereas I feel like with TikTok and Instagram, it's like a lot easier because it's just one minute. Create concept and boom. And then those those algorithms like can carry you so hard. Like just two weeks ago, I my Instagram increased by 100,000. Just two weeks ago um, because of one video. I haven't seen that on YouTube, not for me at least. And even on YouTube, I'm doing shorts. So the shorts are actually getting more subscribers, but it's easier to make. So for me, I have actually even stopped my podcast for a while. I'm like, I need to focus my energy on just doing shorts. 
we even had this cool green screen in the back right here so you can just lift it up because yeah so anyways we're doing shorts because it's a lot easier to spread awareness awesome thank you no problem good luck thank you all right let's go to anthony hey sean thanks for coming on um just to add on to ben's question do you have like a posting schedule um, with your tiktoks and youtube because i'm also starting to kind of contact create i'm a realtor and uh, i think it's a good way to get possible leads and uh, become like the thing that people think of when they come to my niche do you think it's do you have like a sorry that was a long ending question but do you have like a posting schedule for how many tiktoks you do a day or when like you do like 10 a day and then you post those like the next 10 days or do you do it every day yeah great question um and by the way, I love what you're doing because that's what I did for my hard money loans because I created specific content on hard money loans. And if I knew that someone would watch a 20 minute long video about boring loans, then they probably use me. So with you, you can just create content about your local market and whatever, and you'll likely do really well. When it comes to YouTube, I do post um, once a week and that is obviously recorded way in advance and then have an editor do everything for me. Um, similar with TikToks. Uh, by the way, I think back to Ben's question, like, well, I don't, you can ask this one, but you don't need to post three times a day on TikTok. Like some people do it. I think it's too much. I usually end up posting maybe three times a week. Um, of course, the more, the merrier, but you might end up burning out or you might end up just creating like garbage content after a while. You know what I mean? Like if you say, oh, I need to do once a day and then you end up creating garbage once a day, that's not good. Like chill, do really good two or three a week. And then that's better than just creating a bunch of random noise. But yeah, I mean, like creating content every day is tiring though. So I wouldn't do it. Thanks. That makes sense. So to follow up with that, Sean, um, if you're doing like three TikToks a week, <clears throat> how far in advance do you have those filmed out? Mm, usually one or two weeks in advance. Like on Monday, I created eight videos, which is a lot of work. And then I sent them to editors. So he, whenever he's done with it, he'll do it. Um, another side note, I'm actually a pretty lazy guy. So, you know, like we, we do enjoy life, right? We go out a lot. We watch a lot of TV and movies and stuff, but we put a lot of work in the beginning so that we can enjoy this kind of lifestyle. Awesome. Uh, let's go next to Gloria. Hey, Sean. Um, I'm just asking as a 16 year old still in high school, um, if you could, go back in time, what would you do as a teenager to prepare yourself for your real estate career? Hmm. That's a really good question. Usually when people ask if I go back in time, what would I do? And I say, I would buy Bitcoin in 2008. But um, what would I do to prepare myself? It's really hard to say because, um, hmm. well, I would say like right now, since you guys are so young and you have the luxury of time, um, you know, there's like an infinite amount of great content, right? Like Dan has an amazing book. There are other podcasts out there that teach you what you need to do. I think 16 is still like young. So I don't know what you can and can't do in, in terms of real estate. Right. Um, I, I recommend for a lot of people who are newer to just go to meetups. I'm not sure if you can go to meetups at 16 years old. Maybe you can, maybe you can't, but meetups are a great place to go because you can talk to other investors and like shadow them and like learn what they do. And because there's so many different ways to invest in real estate, you can then decide, oh, I like this way better than the other way, you know? Um, then when you find the one you want, then just kind of dig into that method and go from there. Thank Hopefully you. Hopefully that helps. Do you have any follow-up questions? Because yeah. yeah. I don't know if I answered that. No, you answered it perfectly. Thank you. Okay, cool. Uh, I'll add a little bit to that, Glory. I think you know, and we have a lot of members who are in their teens still, or, or even still in high school. But I think the best thing you guys can do is, is what you're doing right now. Um, being involved in a community like Sheik Streaks, paying attention to what's out there on social media, bigger pockets, different books, you know, just continue to educate yourself. So when the time comes, you're ready to pull the trigger. You're confident in what you know. You're confident in the niche that you're going to go into. Um, and the other thing, obviously, is to start earning more and, and saving some money. So it does take money to invest in real estate. Uh, 
And, yeah, you know, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, because I think a lot of people would try to get into real estate with like no money down and just buying everything that that's a little bit risky. Like we, I prefer to have that base on my own and learn it. And, you know, I think like around 25 or so, that's when I was ready to buy my first property. Um, so before that time, again, learning the fundamentals of saving and investing, if you have that fundamental, then by the time you're 25 or whatever, you'll be able to buy real estate and then everything will snowball from there. All right, let's go to Daniel next. Yeah, a uh, question on outsourcing. Jabbar, I hope I'm not stealing your question. I know you've put something in the chat about it, um, but and maybe this is applicable to uh, you as well. But um, I just kind of how you think through that, how you've gone about that, a little bit more background on me. Um, so I I own about, have about $2 million uh, that we own across seven units. Uh, and I'm getting to the point now where I am starting to get burned out with some stuff, self-manage everything, um, and really don't outsource anything at this point, plus uh, a, basically a part-time job as a real estate agent and a full-time job um, as a syndication manager slash uh, acquisitions person. So I'm to the point where I am ready to offload. Um, I've dropped content creation pretty much uh I, I haven't done it really in the past year which is something i wanted to but just haven't had the time so i guess back to the question outsourcing on just the day-to-day -day real estate activities and then on like the editing content creation like how are you able to release those and how'd you go about that sure um so like you mentioned at some point you're gonna get burned out and then when you burn out you have no output so you you should not burn out at the end of the day, look at your schedule and look at what you like to do and what you really hate doing. For me, I really hated the editing process. Um, I just thought it was super time consuming. You already spent so much time recording and coming up with the idea. Why then spend so much more time editing it? And, and knowing that there is someone out there who does it way, way better than you, just to let go. So that was for me, like I, editor, gone. Um, sometimes even content creation, like the idea itself, someone else can help me with that. Um, with property management, from day one, I already knew that I didn't want to be a property manager. Uh, my dad was in real estate. Well, he's in real estate. He's in, he was an agent, and he is also in property management. And I saw that he got squeezed from both sides. Like the owners were always mad at him, the tenants were always mad at him, and he was just stressed all the time. So I thought, well, let me just be an owner then. And then we can make passive income that way. So I I, I also everything I don't want to do basically. So I only do things that only I can do, right? Like for content, it can only be me really for my face. Um, mm -hmm. Everything else can be pushed aside. And, and where exactly did you find that editor? Was it just somebody in your sphere or was it a website? Yeah, great question. So I actually outsource a lot of my work uh, overseas. So I use a, a website called onlinejobs.ph. It's a site that connects you with freelance um, virtual assistants based in the Philippines. So yeah, you just connect with them through that website and then find someone you like. Um, I think the hardest part with that website is that there's actually a lot of people who want to work with you. So you have to like the work for you as a manager is to sort through all the different candidates, find out a system to like interview the ones that seem most like the best and then hire the right one. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. I just, I just saw Jabbar's chat. You question taker, question stealer. All right. Um, great question though. That's why two, two of you thought of it. Uh, let's go next to Kyle. Hi, Sean. Um, so my question, um, is how did you come up with the money for your first, maybe not your first deal, but your first couple, I assume most people at some point run out of money and need to find a way to finance. So did you use something like a uh, private money lender or did you just, you know, or, and the second part was, um, did you have a certain criteria for buying your first properties? Um, were you planning on using the Burr strategy or was there something else? Yeah, great question. So I think I mentioned from Gloria's question, uh, for me, buying that first property was harder because again, you have to save from, from nothing. Uh, and that's what I did from a very young age because uh, I was working as an intern at Boeing and talking to my coworkers who were all dissatisfied from their jobs. I realized, okay, I cannot rely on this company. I need to figure it out on myself. Um, and so at a younger age, not as young as you guys, but at a young age, I was reading a lot of books about investing, about saving money, about investing in index stocks and all that stuff or index funds. 
And then, so from there, I was able to create a good base where I wasn't spending too much money. I was investing a lot and the stock market increased during that time. So I was able to have enough savings to buy properties. So actually, we, we haven't even used a private money lender except for our latest Burr project, which was just last year. Um, everything has been just from our own um, reserves. And um, yeah, like the original strategy was just to buy a standard rental property. You know, the numbers just had to make sense from day one, but I wasn't looking for anything super creative. I wasn't looking for anything that needed like a crazy remodel. Because again, from the, for your very first project, if that one goes wrong, you could be out of the game forever. So I knew like I needed to just make sure it was a, a solid base hit. Didn't need to be a home run. Awesome. I forgot Thank what your you. second question was. Um, no, it was kind of related to that. I just, what was your criteria specifically? Um, and okay. have you done mostly burrs or are they just mostly um, just regular rentals? Uh, maybe 75% are just regular rentals where they're already good to go from day one with, of course, some upside, potential upside in the future. Um, and then maybe 25% of that has some kind of major rehab component to it. Like it's really in bad condition. We have to do a renovation. Uh, again, most of the markets that we're in are like really affordable. So it's maybe 15,000 for a cosmetic rehab. It's not like too crazy. The biggest one we did was the one we did last year. We bought this house for $190,000. It was super gross. It was like vacant for two years, covered in black mold. Um, I went inside for, for content, you know, for the grams, but my wife wouldn't go inside for health reasons. Um, but then, yeah, we renovated the property, uh, did a cash out refinance afterwards, got all of our money back out and then some, and now the property rents. So, oh, and it's worth like double. Yeah, double what we paid for it already. So it was a, it was a really good deal for us. Good stuff. Um, I think I remember seeing some of the, the uh, videos from that, yeah. that really bad house. I think I remember those. Yeah. Um, all right, let's go to Ethan next. Hey, Sean. Thanks for coming out. Um, so my first question is just, um, I've heard here and there about it, but what are you, like, what are your, th I have a few questions, so I mean, I hope you're okay with answering them. Hopefully these sure. are useful, but uh, my first question is, what do you think about uh, REITs? And have you ever, even did you start your journey in investing in them, or have you ever even done them? Sure. So I haven't ever purchased a REIT. Mm -hmm. um, the main reason is because I felt like the whole purpose of real estate was that I have control. If I didn't want control, I would just buy a stock. So I do buy stocks, right? I'm not completely investing in real estate. Um, we do own stocks, we own crypto, and we own um, real estate. Um, but I've never gotten to REITs. It was just like, what was the point if I could just invest in real estate itself? But again, to each their own. I think REITs are great for people who know what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, the second one, I wanted to kind of elaborate a little bit more off of Kyle's question. Something that I feel like I suffer with a lot is paralysis by analysis. Uh, so it's just like, you know, I'm always looking for, I want everything. I want to know everything before I do it. And recently I've helped myself be able to like, kind of let go of that habit. But whenever you're investing in a property, are there certain metrics that you're looking at? And like, I know like the accessibility to like employment, accessibility to certain like facilities that aren't increase the value of a property, but are you looking at like, um, like cap rates or anything like that. Let me ask you, um, where are you in your journey right now? Like what, what are you doing? In so right now I'm working full-time starting up a business, but right now I'm looking into getting my first FHA because I know after a certain amount of time, I could potentially run it out. I'm in Dallas, Texas. So the market isn't exactly the best here, which also makes me a little reluctant to even get a house here because there's potential I could start working remote soon. So if I work around, I might as well just relocate to a more affordable area or even try and get a job in a more affordable area. That's funny because we moved to Dallas, Texas from oh, the Bay really? Area. Yeah. Crazy. This is our affordable area. Dang. I mean, it's nice here. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, it is nice here. It's just, uh, I don't know, whenever I, I think about investing in a property, it's like, okay, it's like, oh, like FHA loan, like not, like minimum, like you can really do like 3.5% down, but obviously like the interest rates would be, I think either interest or the mortgage loan would be higher. And then, so I want something a little bit more affordable, like probably like 10% down, like at the minimum. And then that's still like on a decent property. Cause I'm looking at duplexes, which are pretty hard to come by in Dallas. Um, it's like, what, like $40,000, $50,000 at least like to put down. 
uh, maybe more than that. So I don't know. Yeah. Uh, back to the, I guess to sum it all up, is there anything that you specifically look at in a property, like any rates or metrics or anything? Um, like, yes. But then again, we also invest out of state. Whereas I feel like you're trying to buy something to live in. Yeah. Through the FHA loan program, right? Like you have to yeah. live in it for one year at least and then, uh, and then dip. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think Dallas is a decent market. Um, like we did buy something recently in Waco, but I don't know if you want to live in Waco. <laughs> no. Um, and um, yeah, honestly, it's really hard because when it comes to what you're doing, that's more like a house hacking thing. Yeah. Because it's, it's just completely different. So for my property in the Bay Area, I house hacked that one too. Uh, I made sure it was a place that I wanted to live in. So for me, it was more important um, like location for my own comfort level versus all these crazy metrics of like job growth or whatever, which we look at for when we buy a rental property. Mm-hmm. Again, for the house hack, it was more like, where do I want to live? Where is it close yeah. to my work? Stuff like that. Job opportunities. And I, I rented out my rooms to my friends. That was really fun. Um, if you're buying a random house in the middle of nowhere, just because it's good or whatever, you might not be happy living there for a year. Right. And if you, I don't know if you have a, like a girlfriend or spouse or, you know, partner, they, they may not want to live where you are trying to move to as well. So you have to consider all these different facts too. Yeah, no, that's definitely a good insight. And I guess uh, the last thing that I, I had a different question, but it kind of, you can't answer that. But based off of something you said, you said you invest out of state. Yep. And as I don't know, uh, I had a, at my last job, I had a boss, you know, he had like seven to 10 properties, but he, his risk tolerance is very low. And his concept was always, never invest outside of a 25 to 50 mile radius from where you live because he self-manages. And I feel like, especially if you don't know if it's out of state, it can be risky because you can't really validate the credentials of a property management company or you can't trust someone as much. So how did you establish that ability to trust another property management company? Like were there like steps that you took to validate their credentials or uh, what would you say about that? Yeah, that's an amazing question. So when you were, I mean, that's probably the most important part um, because your property manager can make or break you. Mm -hmm. We typically hire someone based on referrals. So we will have connections in that area. And there's a saying that goes, A players refer other A players. So you want to make sure that your your team is solid. And because like people know that their reputation is at risk, if they refer you to someone that's bad, like they won't refer you to bad people. Um. And then for, for the places that we didn't have connections, um, we just made a lot of phone calls. Um, so that's the work up front. You make a lot of phone calls. You talk to a lot of property managers out there. And you can kind of see like how their system is. Some of them, they will like not be responsive um, or they'll be rude on the phone. And then there'll be others who'll be like really kind and like take their time to like explain everything to you. Um, there's also different personality types. Like this one property manager I have reminds me of my dad. So I like working with him a lot. Um, and just stuff like that, like, I think that's the work you have to do. And then you have to, again, realize that they won't do the job as good as you will, but because you are outsourcing it, it, it frees your mind up to do other things that are more important. That's the way I, I, I think of it. Yeah, no, that's all the questions I had. Thanks, Sean. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll add my two cents there too. I, I think out-of-state investing is, is a great way to go to build a portfolio. Um, and, and that's what my wife and I did. Denver is very expensive. Detroit was not. But I, I wouldn't recommend, and I don't think, Ethan, this is what you were, I don't think this is the way you're heading, but I wouldn't recommend to anybody to, to do your first deal as an out-of-state investment. I think um, your first one or two deals should be closer to home so that you are much more involved and you can you know, really learn the ropes about buying, managing, um, finding tenants, maintaining a property and, and whatnot. And and I'm a, I believe in this big time that house hacking is by far the best strategy for young people to get started in real estate investing. Um, sounds like Sean, that was your first property. That was my first one was a house hack. Uh, yeah. You just learn so much by living there, managing it and, and dealing with all the day-to-day stuff that you can then take with you when you do some other types of investments. Even the whole like process of buying a property, um, that's already complicated in itself. I mean, the first time you do it, at least now that we do it, it's, it's no big deal. But the first time you do it, it's like a lot of money you're wiring to someone, right? And signing a lot of documentation um, can get confusing. Yes, yeah, some of our members have learned that, that buying a property is a pretty um, 
intense and sometimes complicated process. Absolutely worth it. Absolutely worth it. But Catalina's going through that right now. Jabbar's gone through that a couple of times. And even I think he shared with us that he got scanned on a transfer, a wire transfer on his last closing. I can't remember how much. I don't think it was too much. But um, yeah, you just you really want to that closing process and, and the whole process of, you know, trying to, to search for a property and then getting under contract, making offers, getting under contract, the inspection, um, the appraisal, uh, that whole, and then the closing is, is huge too. Um, actually for the members, Catalina just put a great post in our community, uh, kind of with, I think 10 to 15, the 10 to 15 steps that she's gone through about, buying that first property. And it was a really good, you know, very concise list of here are the steps to buying a property. So you should definitely check that out. Um, good. Let's go to Jabbar for our next question. Hey, Sean, how's it going, man? How's it going? It's great. Um, my question was sort of on the lines of uh, content. So like, and you don't have to answer this question if you don't want to, but I'm, I would, I just am curious, like, how, what would you say, like, um, content creation and social media, like how, what, I guess if you break it down percentages, how big of a role has it played in your financial uh, position today? Um, and in your like financial independence journey, I'm kind of at a point where I, I I should be making content, I want to, but it's super hard to prioritize it because I'm so busy trying to like do it, do it, do it. Um, but I also want to like share, share, share as well. Um, but I'm I, I know it's worth it. I, I just am trying to just see what the benefits are from other people because maybe it will give me a bigger kick in the butt to take it more seriously. Yeah, sure. Um, so content is a very lucrative place to go. Um, I don't think I'm at that place yet where the ad revenue from content can sustain my lifestyle. You know what I mean? Like from like YouTube ads or TikTok, whatever, creator funds. However, the, um, the exposure because of content opens up a lot of doors. So like it gives you a lot of opportunities that you may not have. Um, like I mentioned before, I do hard money loans, but I don't cold call people. They come to me because of my YouTube videos. You know, I made tens of thousands of dollars just because of one video. Um, because my channel is relatively big now, I get sponsorship opportunities from big companies who are like, here, here's a couple of thousand dollars, make a video for us. We do have a course on how to buy our you how to buy your first asset rental property. And because of our our following, we we're able to promote that. Um, and that's generated us a lot of money as well. So Again, like, I don't know if like creating content, especially in the early days, maybe for the first like two years, you probably won't make that much money from just like the ads, but think about like what you can do with it. Um, like I remember, um, I think another person here, he was an agent, right? So if you can promote content that um, highlights your services or your expertise, people will call you for those services. Yeah, you can be very lucrative with it. Um, I, again, I have a friend who is a real estate agent in the Bay Area. He makes content on um, like the local happenings. And because of that, people see, oh, this guy's an agent too. Let me call him. And then, you know, one deal in the Bay Area is $25,000. So yeah, like I think you can get exposure through content, but don't expect content to pay through your lifestyle for a while. Like it takes, it takes some, some time. Got you. It's, it sounds just like an investment. Like you're just investing for like the, longevity of things rather than like the instant gratification yeah pretty much and it takes some time too right like i've been doing it for three years now and even now like i don't think my youtube is doing that great um it's just that my short form content has taken off i got lucky with that got it thank you yeah sorry to hear yeah. you got scammed now you it's, know it's always call good. title <laughs> Lessons uh, learned. Yep, it'll never happen again. And, and he shared it with the group, which is, I mean, it takes some courage to share your mistakes. So the members were able to learn from that and hopefully they remember um, his mistake. Uh, the, the one thing about content creation, and I, I don't, I don't, I'm not, 
I'm not really in that space. Chic Freaks makes some content, but I don't, I, that's outsourced for me. Um, I see it is a job, Sean, maybe you can touch on this, like creating consistent content on even one platform, let alone two or three, that that's creating a job for you. Now the payoff can be immense. So it could be worth every minute of that time. But it's something where if, if you're going to be successful, you have to be consistent over a long period of time, at least one or two years to, to kind of start to see some benefits, sometimes shorter. I mean, some people do, I think, kind of just blow up out of nowhere and, and it takes a little luck maybe, but uh, and you have to be working hard. Um, but just make sure that you're in it for the long haul because you can't kind of jump in and out of content creation and expect to find success. Sean, would you agree with that? Yeah, totally. Like I mentioned, uh, I've been doing it for three years now. It's a long time. And uh, most people that I know who have gotten big, they've been doing it for at least at least two years. Yeah. Um, Ethan, did you have another question? Your hand. Okay, awesome. Uh, yeah, I just had one more question. It might be a little niche, but um, what are your thoughts on multifamily in Dallas? And do you have any properties that are multifamily? Yeah, the most that we have is a fourplex. Mm. Um, I do want to get into commercial multifamily in the future, but for the past four years, it's been really hyped from a lot yes. of different channels, um, which has caused the cap rates to go down, which means the price is increasing. So people are paying a lot more for these properties. And it got to a point where on a per unit basis, it was cheaper to buy single family homes. So then we're like, let's just buy single family homes uh, because, you know, Commercial multifamily is a riskier asset. So I haven't gotten to it yet, but yeah, that's something that we are looking into in the future. Just pricing doesn't make sense right now. And uh, I know like, uh, just to build on top of that, I know like the ring, like the DFW ring is expanding. Like, I think Sherman's a part of DFW now. Like, are you, what areas are you looking in if, if that's not too personal to ask? So, you know, we just moved here a few months ago and we spent the first few months just kind of getting settled. Um, so even, you know, we're not experts at the Dallas market. We only have mm -hmm. this one property here. Um, and it's kind of like a touch and go kind of thing. Like when we decide to start looking again, we'll do more research. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right. Freaks out there. We have time for maybe one more question. Anybody want to jump in? I want to jump in. Um, I wanted to ask him. Um, where are, I guess, some of the, the better meetups that you found here in Texas? I'm over here in San Antonio. Um, I know that Jabbar said that he has one next week in Houston and another one in Dallas. So really just where did you go to find these meetups uh, in your area? Yes, yeah, so like I mentioned, I'm originally from the Bay Area and all my connections are back there. Um, so a good place to go is meetup.com. That's where I used to host my meetups. You can just type in the location you're in. Um, you know, bigger pockets also has a nice meetup like section that kind of shows you where you can go. Uh, I mean, if you're from San Antonio, I wouldn't go to Houston. I think it's, it's like too far to go for just a meetup, right? And you're not, like you're getting value, but I don't think it's worth that, that time. Um, if anything, you can start your own meetup, right? That's probably the best thing to do. Cause then everyone wants to talk to you. Right. And it's really, um, it's really nice that way. That's what I did. Right. I made my own meetup. Sounds good. Thank you, sir. No problem. I actually think that's a great idea. Um, all of you should consider the idea of, uh, so meetup.com is a website that has tons of meetups all over the country for, for lots of different types of topics and, niche, and niches and, and, and interests. Um, go to, go to meetup.com, create an account. At the very least, find some meetups happening around you, but take Sean advice it does not take much to start a meetup. I did it once a long time ago for like a happy hour group. Uh, and, and, you, and you just kind of put it out there. And then, you know, maybe you have a get together in a park or a get together at a restaurant. Make sure you call the restaurant and know, and so they know you're coming. But, um, you know, the restaurants will be great. They'll be happy to have you. They won't even maybe necessarily charge you any money. They just want to know <clears throat> how many people are coming and when. Uh, and then you do become the person, everyone coming to that, that meetup knows your name because you're the one that organized it. You're the one that is the, the organizer of that meetup group. Um, so you can grow your network really fast.
by creating a meetup. It does take a little work, takes a little courage. It's probably out of your comfort zone for most of you, um, but definitely well worth the time spent to meet people in your area. Yeah. And it's not that hard, right? You just, again, I think the coordinating is probably the hardest part, like finding the location that's cool with it. At, at some point we even just use big L's because they have a nice, they had a nice like outdoor um, seating area that wasn't being used. So we just said, Hey, everyone come over there. Um, I had a, a friend who owned a bar. So I said, Hey, let me uh, bring people to your bar. I said, yeah, it's cool. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we're going to wrap this up so we can uh, respect Sean's time. Sean, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It was a pleasure having you and thanks for giving all, you know, all this great advice and wisdom and experience to our younger, to our, to our members who are younger than us anyway. So yeah. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll be in touch. And are you going to FinCon or BPCon by chance? Yeah, we're going to FinCon. All right. I'll see you there. It'd be great to meet you in person. Yeah, see you there. And by the way, for everyone that's here, and if you happen to follow me, um, it is Sean Les Real Estate. But just be aware, there are a lot of fake accounts out there who are trying to scam you. So if I, if I quote unquote, message you saying, hey, you want to invest in my crypto fund? It's not me. Okay, don't, don't talk to them. Do you want to drop your... Uh, Instagram and or TikTok in the chat real quick. Yeah, so sure. they don't, so they, they can just copy it, paste it for later. Um, or if you put the whole website in there, then that'd be good. Yeah, While he's Sean Liz real estate <clears throat> on TikTok and Instagram. Perfect. Yeah. No extra like dots or dashes. Yeah, no extra S's, no extra underscores. Those are yeah. scam accounts. There's one that has a hundred thousand followers. That's so crazy. There, there's so many people in this space that have, dozens of these fake accounts the yeah. the industry needs to figure out a way to get that dialed in i don't know what's going on it's pretty bad um all right sean feel free to pop off and enjoy the rest of the time tell sharon hi and look forward to seeing you in orlando okay sounds good if you like this video and want to see more like it make sure you give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our youtube channel you should also go check out our website and instagram which are both linked below this video Thanks again for watching, now go and get your freak on.